What exactly comes to mind when you think of Top Gun Maverick? Is it the roar of jet engines? Maybe it's the intoxicating confidence of a fighter pilot. Or perhaps you jump straight to Miles Teller in jean shorts. Either way, you probably don't immediately think of the word underrated, but I do. You see, despite dominating at the box office and receiving praise almost universally from fans and critics alike, there is one aspect of the film that is consistently overlooked, and that is the screenplay. For some reason, even the biggest supporters of the Top Gun sequel seem to dismiss the writing as merely serviceable, or just an excuse to have great action scenes. But this could not be further from the truth, which is why I feel the need, I feel the need. to make a 2700 word video breaking down how the themes, character arcs, story structure, and tone all add up to not only one of the best blockbusters in modern cinema, but a screenplay that is as Oscar-worthy as it is crowd-pleasing. Good morning, aviators. This is your captain speaking. And today, we'll be starting off with a lesson in theme. Just like how wind is everything to a sailor, theme is everything to a screenplay. In fact, it's why we tell stories in the first place. Someone who understands this better than most is Maverick himself. Tom Cruise spent decades refusing to follow up the original Top Gun, and simply stated that he'd only do a sequel if they found the right story. And for a long time, even Cruise didn't believe that would ever happen. It wasn't until director Joseph Kaczynski met with him on the set of Mission Impossible and pitched him on his vision for the sequel that Cruz finally decided to greenlight the project. But why did Kaczynski's pitch convince Tom when so many other directors had tried and failed? Well, the secret to that lies in the name of the film itself. Kaczynski was insistent that the film not be titled Top Gun 2, but rather Maverick. It had to be a character story that built upon the first film, and dug deep into what makes everyone's favorite fighter pilot tick. We needed to explore the grief he had yet to process, and the relationships he had yet to mend. Tom Cruise and Joseph Kaczynski both knew that all the adrenaline pumping action and groundbreaking photography in the world wouldn't mean anything to an audience audience if we didn't care about the characters. In choosing to focus the film around themes of aging, loss, fatherhood, and making way for the next generation, they created a worthy successor that not only recaptured the joy and magic of the first film, but built upon it in deep and meaningful ways. That's why this is not some unnecessary legacy sequel, nor is it some schlocky action movie with a throwaway story. This this is Top Gun Maverick. Now, if this film is fundamentally a character piece, then the success or failure of the movie rests in how well the characters and their arcs are crafted. Starting off with the title character, Maverick easily undergoes the most drastic transformation in the whole film, and it's set up beautifully from the very beginning. Normally, in a film set multiple decades after its predecessor, you'd expect to see a big change in the lives of the lead characters. If we look at the Star Wars franchise, which utilizes a similar time gap as the Top Gun movies, the main characters have changed radically over the course of three decades. However, Pete Mitchell is more or less the same exact guy we met back in the 80s. Sure, he flies experimental planes rather than the iconic Tomcat, but Maverick is still very much, for lack of a better word, a Maverick. Captain Mitchell risks his own life constantly. He avoids advancing through the ranks. He pushes people away and never stays in one spot long enough to settle down. And while it would be easy to write this off and say that Mav is simply too aggressive, it's actually a lot deeper than that. You see, I initially thought that Top Gun Maverick was a story about a man learning to forgive himself. That over the course of the narrative, Mav was more or less making amends for the loss of his Rio and best friend. But Maverick already did that in the original Top Gun. In reality, Maverick's core arc throughout the film is learning how to be a father to Rooster. He even goes as far as saying, I was trying to be the father he lost. I just I wish I would have done it better.
for the first two thirds of the story. Maverick's problem is that he's overprotective. After what happened to Goose, Matt feels like it's his duty to keep him safe no matter the cost. This is why he's so hesitant to allow Rooster to fly the mission in the final act and why it's eventually revealed that he pulled Rooster's papers in an attempt to keep him from becoming a pilot in the first place. But just like with an actual parent, it's not Maverick's job to shelter Rooster from the real world. It's his duty to prepare him for it. Mav is supposed to be a teacher, and this is what Iceman helps him remember. Obviously, he can't guarantee that everyone will come home safe. No one can but he can prepare them for the risk they are about to take. He can inspire them by showing them that the mission is possible, and most importantly, he can teach them how to be more like him. But this is what scares Maverick the most. He sees a great deal of himself in Rooster, but until he learns to let go and trust the young pilot, Rooster won't be able to live up to his true potential. That's why my favorite moment in the whole film is when the two reunite after being shot down. Even though Rooster has just saved his life, Mav is absolutely furious. What the hell were you even thinking? You told me not to think! That right there is the culmination of Maverick's character arc. Suddenly, he realizes why his approach to teaching slash parenting wasn't working. It's only when he lets Rooster follow in his footsteps that the two men can truly reconcile their relationship. It's a beautiful progression for the character, and really justifies the creation of this sequel decades after the original was released in theaters. What's even more impressive is that this level of care is put into almost every character in the film. Rooster, in specific, has a really nuanced arc that I love to watch, especially on subsequent viewings. Rooster starts out the film as an admirable pilot by any standard. He's capable in the cockpit, and as his fellow pilots quickly learn, he's more than willing to sacrifice himself to protect others. The problem is that he hesitates. He overthinks things and needs to learn how to fly on instinct alone. This is what elegantly interweaves his character arc with Maverick's. The biggest thing holding him back is doubt. The fact that Mav pulled his papers not only infuriates him, but makes Rooster question whether or not he's truly good enough. The moment he's finally able to overcome that that doubt is when he reaches out to his father. Up until then, he was preoccupied with the legacy of his father. It was like a shadow hanging over him, but reaching out as he does allows him to connect on a spiritual level with his dad and finally step out of that shadow. He drops the bomb without computer guidance and saves Maverick's life because in the absence of doubt, he is able to be the man that he was always destined to become. Heck, even a character like Hangman gets an arc, going from a selfish hotshot to a teammate that refuses to leave others behind. However, character arcs are nothing if they don't have an adequate backbone upon which they are built. And this is why we need to discuss the pitch-perfect story structure of Top Gun Maverick. A lot of people like to think that screenplays don't need structure, or that focusing too much on structure creates an overly formulaic movie. Those people are wrong. Sure, if all you have going for your film is that it neatly follows the three-act structure or the hero's journey, then of course it's going to feel soulless. But for professional-level writing, structure is what allows the more poetic elements to shine. In the case of Top Gun Maverick, its strict adherence Adherence to the three-act structure is what allows all the other elements, like character arcs, theme, and spectacle, to flow together seamlessly and ultimately build upon one another. Act 1 is all about Maverick. Not Pete Mitchell, but Maverick. See, despite expressing an interest in teaching at the end of the original Top Gun, it's revealed that Mav quickly fizzled out of that role and immediately went back to his old ways, living fast and dangerous on the cutting edge of aviation. As the Dark Star sequence shows us, Mav cares about others and wants them to succeed. He's not selfish, but only knows how to get the job done when he is personally in the pilot seat. 
However, that obsession with pushing the limits keeps him stuck in the same old cycle of never leaving well enough alone. I don't like that book, man. It's the only one I got. Sure, he saves the Dark Star program, but in gunning past Mach 10, he also destroys the prototype all those people put who knows how long into developing. The inciting incident, which is when Admiral Iceman covers for Maverick and reassigns him to teach a new batch of fighter pilots, introduces a chance for growth. If he succeeds in preparing a new generation of Aviator for the challenges ahead, then he'll successfully have moved beyond his core issue of having to do everything himself. However, when he arrives at Top Gun and realizes Rooster is one of the candidates, suddenly his ability to let go is tested. The stakes are raised and Act 1 concludes with Maverick fully committing to this daunting task. Act 2 is almost exclusively focused on the training process for the mission at the end of the film. We get to know the pilots, the planes, and most importantly, the mission. Perhaps the greatest gift of Top Gun's structure is the way in which the final mission is so perfectly established before it happens. We are so thoroughly briefed on the plan and made so fiercely aware of how overwhelming the odds are that the film's finale is as exhilarating as it is understandable. But we'll get back to that later. Over the course of Act 2, Maverick is forced to grow as a person and figure out how he can teach his students to complete the mission at hand. As director Joseph Kaczynski once described it, Act 2 is sort of like forcing the audience to eat their vegetables in order to properly appreciate Act 3 for dessert. Now, when those vegetables are watching FA-18s push their airframes to the absolute limit, it's not exactly a chore to sit through. But what makes the pacing of the second act even more enthralling is the incredibly emotional midpoint. See, a midpoint is the most underappreciated part of a screenplay structure, but it's integral to keeping an audience's attention throughout the longest act of the movie. Essentially, what it does is shift the momentum of the narrative, or force the protagonist to go from passive to active. The midpoint in this movie is the reunion with Iceman. Up until then, Mav is seriously struggling with getting through to his students, and Ice has to remind him that he can't protect all of his pilots. Instead, all he can do is teach them how to look out for one another. Upon realizing this, Mav is able to approach his assignment from a new angle, mainly a shirtless beach montage, and legitimately starts making progress in preparing the pilots. However, the Act 2 low point threatens all of the work that he has achieved thus far. See, traditional scripts need to have a moment of immense setback for the main character, as a way to test their commitment to the task at hand. Either they choose to give up in the face of adversity, or they enter into the final act with a newfound resolve. For Maverick, this is the death of his wingman and closest friend. Not only does he lose the one person who believed he was capable of growth, but he also is thrown off the mission now that the Admiral can't vouch for him. Any normal person would give up right then and there, but Mav doesn't play by the rules. Instead, he quote-unquote borrows a Super Hornet without permission and flies the training course at record speed. But the thing is, he doesn't do this out of ego. Mav at the beginning of the movie might have, but this version of Captain Mitchell is only breaking the rules to prove that the mission is possible, thereby giving hope to his students. In doing this, he proves that he is grown as a character, but that growth is about to be tested. Like I mentioned previously, Act 3 is a superb finale to an amazing movie. We are so intimately familiar with how the mission is supposed to go that every success puts a smile on your face, and the slightest mishap has you on the edge of your seat. It truly is the definition of blockbuster cinema. Something that makes this finale especially iconic is it too can be subdivided into to three parts. You begin with the mission as planned. When it goes wrong, we get an escape sequence with Mav and Rooster. And finally, the climax of the film peaks with a desperate dogfight all the way back to the carrier. The fact that they somehow managed to up the ante, this laid into a movie that is built upon antes being upped, 
proves just how top-notch the writing in this film is. But with that being said, there is a special sauce to this movie that I haven't really addressed yet. You see, even with the thoughtfully crafted character arcs and rigid story structure, this film very easily could have faltered in one key aspect the tone. It would have been easy to drench this film in irony, deriding the cheesy tone of the original and relying on meta humor to avoid the potential of being considered cringe. But like the Honey Badger of Legend, this movie does not care. It has the courage to take itself 100% seriously. It doesn't undercut a single moment, but rather invites the audience to bask in its sincerity. It gives each and every person in the theater permission to get lost in the joy of a great story. Through the victories, the setbacks, the laughter, the tears, this film wears its heart on its sleeve. Far too many films try to be in on the joke or lampshade their own content, but Top Gun Maverick has the bravery to say, we care about these characters, and you know what? So should you. Will this film win big at the Academy Awards? Who knows? Even if it does, I'm sure people will still find ways to discredit various components of the project. But at the very least, I hope that this video made some of you realize that this script is in fact Oscar worthy, and perhaps more importantly, why it's just a darn good film. I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.